This morning, I want to continue in the series this week and next week, then I'm going to wrap up the series on Fresh Start. We have looked at your health. We've looked at your emotional health. We've looked at your thought life. We've looked at having a bigger heart for God. This morning, I want to talk about becoming financially healthy. And when I talk about financially healthy, I'm not going to talk so much about giving or tithing or generosity or budgeting this morning. I want to begin with a story that Jesus told that I've always found fairly confusing. I remember the first time I read it, and to this day I had this little black King James leather Bible, and I remember the first time reading it, it didn't make sense, and when I asked some other mature Christians, they said to me, it's hard to understand, and I just figured it was one of those things as you got older, you just kind of become smarter. But it's one of those things you really have to dig into to understand the story that Jesus is telling. I thought the best way I could illustrate that was with something that happened last year in Paris that the New Yorker magazine carried a story on. There was a baker in Paris that almost died of carbon monoxide poisoning, and a homeless man was walking by, and he discovered what was happening, and he called the emergency medical services, and they got into the bakery. They rescued him, and he was so grateful, the baker, his name was Flamont, Michel Flamont. He was so grateful for the man, for, to the man for saving his life that he told him, he said, I will train you how to be a baker. I will teach you how to be a baker, and I will give you my business for one dollar, less than one euro, less than one euro. He said, I'll give you my whole business. And so he began training the baker, and he began or training the homeless man. His name was Jerome. And as he began to train him, he thought the man was making progress. But then one night, he got news, and he came down to the bakery, and the guy had set a bar up in there, and it was filled with drunk people and homeless people. And... And there was an argument that erupted. Jerome threw some very nasty insults and threats at Mr. Flamont. And so he ended up taking the bakery back, not telling him, you know, you've got to leave, you've got to clear out, because he failed to manage the opportunity that God had given him. He failed to manage the opportunity that Mr. Flamont gave him. That story, I think, will help us understand the story that I'm going to read to you in just a moment. But you need to know who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees. We know this from the context of the story. And the Pharisees are arrogant. They're proud. They love money. They love what money does for them. They love the power that it brings them. They love the possessions that they're able to get with it. They love the position that money brings to them. If you have any resources at all, you know that you carry a certain amount of position that people look up to you. They look to you for advice. They look to you for counsel. And at times, they even look to you for resources. The really successful people I know that are wealthy, they don't love their money. They use their money to glorify God with. They don't demean people the way the Pharisees did. They don't become legalistic about money the way the Pharisees did. They don't see their money as a way for prestige or success. They see themselves, the really successful people that I know, they see themselves as stewards. They see themselves as managers of what God has given them. However, as I near the end of my life, and I'm in this fourth quarter and well into this fourth quarter, and from time to time I get reminded of the brevity of life, not only from the people I deal with, but from the things I deal with in my own life, I come to a conclusion as I sat down and I begin to list out the people that I had known through the years, pastors, church members, parachurch leaders. I began to list out those that had been really successful with their money, managing their money well, whether they had little or whether they had great amounts of resources. One of the things, unfortunately, I came to the conclusion was most Christians are not very good money managers. And I don't say that to insult or to demean. I'm just telling you what I've discovered through the years 
most Christians aren't very good money managers. Most Christians find it hard to do what many of you do in this congregation, and that is to tithe and to give unto the Lord, to set apart, set apart the first 10% unto the Lord. Most people are spending more than they earn in a year, and so they end up with consumer debt that's hanging over them and putting them deeper and deeper into the hole. Honestly, they're not financially healthy, and yet when I read the Bible, just like we looked at with mental health and emotional health and physical health, as we looked at with our relational health that we talked about just recently, God wants you and God wants me, God wants those of you who are watching online, God wants you to be financially healthy and to have peace in your heart. So I'd like for you, if you would, to stand with me and let's look at this story that I want to read to you that Jesus told. Jesus told this story to his disciples. The Pharisees were around, <clears throat> right close by. And he said there was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. Think about Flamont and Jerome. Think about Michel Flamont, the owner of the baker, bakery. So grateful. Giving a business for one euro in Paris giving it away to a homeless man to give him an opportunity. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs, and one day a report came that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order because you are going to be fired. Some of you in this room, you've heard that before. Not that you've been dishonest, but you're going to be fired. You're going to be let go. You're going to be laid off. You know what happens inside of you. You know that feeling. You know the dread of having to go home and tell your wife and your children that you don't have a job. I've done this a long time. I've walked through this with a lot of families. I've seen the, the sweat and the perspiration that comes on men's foreheads, especially upon single mothers. He says, you're going to be fired. Well, the manager thought to himself, he's not panicking, he's thinking. Notice that. He's not panicking, he's thinking. Now what? My boss has fired me. I don't have the strength to dig ditches, and I love this part, I'm too proud to beg. Can anybody relate to that? Say amen. Oh, we all, that's the original sin, I think, is pride, wanting to be like God. And I'm too proud to beg. Ah, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed money to his employer to come and discuss the situation. He asked the first one, how much do you owe him? And the man replied, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. So the manager said, take the bill and quickly change it to 400 gallons. Do you think that man was happy about this decision? <laughs> yeah. I, you, wait a minute. Are you listening to this? Suddenly your bill has been decreased 50%. How many of you would be happy if your debt load was a decrease 50%? Say Amen. Oh, yeah. It didn't matter that the guy was cheating. He was like, okay, this is legal. I mean, if it's legal, it's okay, right? At least that's the way it works in America. It's legal. So he, he told him, he says, take the bill, quickly change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. He said, well, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. He says, here, take the bill and change it to 800 bushels. Well, <clears throat> the owner of the business, the rich man, finds out about it. And this is what Jesus says. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal. Don't you like that? The dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. How many of you know what the word shrewd means? A few of you do. I've asked that question this week, and I'm surprised. Shrewd means to be smart, sharp, strategic, resourceful. It's not an insult. It's just someone that sees a problem and knows what to be, needs to be done, and then they do it quickly. So Jesus goes on, and it's true. Listen, it's true, and I have been praying this will not be true of Woodland. It's true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. In other words, we need to be smarter. Can you say amen? We need to be more resourceful. Can you say amen? 
That's what Jesus is saying here. He says, so here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. He's not saying buy friends. He's saying use your resources to make eternal friends. Then they will welcome you into an eternal home. For if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth, who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you are not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with the things of your own? No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you. For many of us, you've already begun to work an emotional miracle, a physical miracle, a relational miracle in our lives. I could go on with this, Lord. But this morning, I'm asking you to do a financial miracle in our lives. I'm not asking you to rain down gold dust from heaven. I'm not asking you to rain down $100 bills in this place, Lord. I'm asking you, Father, make us shrewd. Make us, I pray, financially healthy and to raise up children and grandchildren who are financially healthy as well. And I ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody who agreed with me in this prayer said, Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I believe this message can change your life. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I believe this message can change your life. If you are a follower of Jesus, I know this message can change your life. Basically, what I want to talk to you about is faithfulness compared to unfaithfulness. This week, I had lunch with a young friend of mine, a young businessman, smart. I would say he's shrewd very intelligent, and we have been building a friendship over this last seven or eight months, and um, recently we decided we'd get together and have lunch and catch up with one another. So as we had lunch, and he's quite a bit younger than I am, and um, he said something that kind of caught me off guard, and I asked him for permission to share his story, and he says, if, if it will help your community, he says, absolutely, feel free to share it. And I encouraged him to watch, so Daniel, I hope you're watching today and you're part of this service. But Daniel was talking about how difficult it was, if not perhaps impossible, for young adults to be able to buy a home today, to be able to even have the hope of having a home. We talked about some more things of the future. So for just a moment, I was able to share with him how God had blessed my parents, both who came through the Depression, my mother who was a sharecropper's daughter. I didn't go into all of that detail with him. I, then I shared with him how when Becky and I got our first home, that interest rates were sky high. People were losing their homes, people, especially those that took out loans against their house to buy stuff with. People were losing their homes. And we got an exceptional uh, loan at that time where loans were north of 15 and 16 percent. We got an exceptional loan of 12 percent, and we built our first home. But we had put down, you know, we had bought and paid for our land. We had already put in the things that were going to be necessary and pay cash for all of that. And so I just shared with him, as Daniel these can happen for you and for everyone else in your generation if you're willing to practice the principles that the Bible gives us. I didn't go into this with Daniel, but I've seen this happen with refugees. I've seen this happen in other nations where people just simply begin to put these principles in effect that we talk about all the time around Woodland. Start with save 10%, excuse me, tithe 10%, give 10% to the Lord, save 10%, and then learn how to live off the 80%. And then as you prosper, that you learn to increase your giving and increase your savings. Most of us in this room have been through a breakup. Most of us, before we got married, or maybe even since you've been married, we've been through some sort of a breakup, and breakups can be very messy. 
Breakups can cause heartache and pain because you've built your life around a person that you thought you could trust and that would be with you forever. And then suddenly that person breaks up with you and the pain and the trauma and the emotion that goes through all of that. Sometimes the breakups have been amicable from what people have told me, but most of the time they've been really messy and painful. And when it comes to changing our relationship with money, that can be very messy because most of us wrestle with the problem of loving our money and loving the things that money can do for us more than we love God. And so in this message this morning, I want to confront our pursuit of money as opposed to the pursuit of the kingdom of God I want to confront the master that we serve in money that we were never created to serve, but money was meant to serve you. We want to confront how that role has been reversed in our lives because it's a wrong relationship. I also want to confront how the desire to acquire more money can damage relationships that we've talked about, can damage physical health that we've talked about, can rob you of emotional health that we've talked about. And I want to talk to you about how to break up and move on so that money is your servant rather than you serving your money. One of the hardest parts of breakups, and I know this not only as having been through them, but as a youth pastor, is the routine that gets established, the phone calls that gets established, the Friday night, Saturday night dates, the person you can always depend upon to sit next to you in church or you sit with in the cafeteria at the university or at college, and you've placed your, your faith in this person and there's a breakup. And then all of a sudden, you've got to establish a new routine. You've got to establish a new way because you still see that person in the community and you're still going to see your bills and you're still going to see money. So how do we acquire new habits to move on in life? How do we seek first the kingdom of heaven and believe Jesus' words that everything else will be added to us? Isn't that what he says? That if we put seeking him first, then everything else will be added. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 10, Jesus said, If you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. The first principle that I see Jesus share in this passage is don't waste money. Don't waste the money that God has entrusted you with. God allowed you to have that money for a reason. God allowed you to have that money for a purpose. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 1, the Bible says, Jesus says, the manager was wasting his employer's money. What we have really belongs to God. And it changes your perspective. It changes my perspective when I realize the money that I have does not belong to me. It belongs to God. We're not like those little gulls and finding Nemo going, mine, 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 mine. It all belongs to the Lord. The second thing that Jesus teaches here in this passage is don't love money. The problem of the heart is exactly that. It's the problem of the heart. It's the heart that loves money. God doesn't say money is evil, but God wants your heart. God doesn't want you loving your money more than you love God. Why do people love money? These are the things I've heard through the years is because of what money can get for them. Money does get position. Money will bring you power. Anytime I'm asked to serve on a board, I know that what I'm being asked to do is to give money. And I have been asked to serve on a lot of boards through the years. And you're expected to maintain a certain level of giving and support because that's what it means. You believe in the program. Children learn to love money when they're young because all of a sudden they see you exchanging money and they realize if they've got a little money, they can get candy. Do they still have the horsey rides at the mall? 
or at the shopping centers. When I was a kid, I always wanted to ride the horsey, but it took money, money for one of my little nephews. He went in and stole some money from his mom and dad and went to school and bought everybody candy that day. He was loaded with friends, and his dad had a whole lesson to teach him. When you're a teenager, money represents your first date, that first movie, the first dinner. It represents being able to have a car and achieve the dream of American independence. And if you're a young adult, money represents your first apartment or the ability to buy your first house. And then you get that first utility bill and you realize mom and dad were really on to something when they said, shut the refrigerator door. That's costing money. You know that water coming out of the spigot is not free. Excuse me, the faucet. Spigot is what you say down south. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus says, you cannot serve God and be a slave to money. And the Pharisees who dearly loved their money heard all of this and scoffed at him. And you know, you might be scoffing at some of what I'm saying this morning, but you're really not scoffing with me. You're scoffing with Jesus. The third thing Jesus says, don't trust your money. That's what he's telling us in this parable. You can lose it. We've seen this happen in our nation with retirement accounts. We've seen it happen with housing. We've seen it happen, and it can happen overnight and so quickly. We've seen banks close. We've seen investment houses close. I've been in nations, multiple different nations, where overnight the economy has collapsed and the chaos and the rioting that takes place. I have learned this, and please take this as an honest confession. It has only been with faithful diligence in our younger years that I learned to trust God more than I trusted money. I was so afraid to ask Becky to marry me because I couldn't promise her all the things that she had living at home with her family. And then she told me, she says, I remember in the early days of my life when my dad started pastoring. She said, honey, I remember when there was no food in the cabinet. I remember when we used to pray that God would provide the meal for that evening. And I have never known anybody more faithful and more consistent with the management of money than my wife. And so much that I've learned from her disposition when it comes from faith to faith. And it's really not that most people love their money. They just love what they can do with their money. Look at Luke 16 and verse 3. Now what? Now stop, because we're going to read the second part of that verse, but look at that. Now what? What happens if the bottom falls out? What are you going to do? Where are you going to turn? He goes on to say, my boss has fired me. The lesson that he's learning there is money is not secure. You can lose your health. You can lose your marriage. You can lose your kids. You can lose your job. You can lose every dollar that you've saved. The Bible says, this is not in your outline. You might want to write it down. But in Psalms 23 and verse 5, the Bible says, In the blink of an eye, wealth disappears, for it will spread wings and fly away like an eagle. We've seen, we're blessed with so many beautiful bald eagles around here. We've seen how eagles just soar away. And the Bible says that it, you have to be careful when it comes to what you put your trust in because your wealth can literally fly off like an eagle. To build security, look at me, don't miss this. To build security, you've got to build it around something that you can never lose, something that cannot be stolen from you, something that cannot be taken from you, something that the economy cannot affect, something that death nor life can affect, and the only one that can give us that kind of security is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Well, yes, praise Him this morning. The fourth thing I would say to you is that Jesus would say to you this morning is don't expect it to satisfy. Don't expect to having a lot of money the bank will satisfy. Your sense, look at me, your sense of self-worth has no connection to your net worth. Your sense of self-worth has no connection to your net worth. I've known people with a sense of self-worth who have very little. 
And they do great things for God, often unseen. And I know people with immense resources, but they have such poor self-worth because they don't know who they are in Christ or they've never connected the dots that they're supposed to surrender their lives to Christ or else they just simply believe there's nothing after and they become despairing of all that they have. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 10 says, if you love money, you will never be satisfied. Underline that. That's why Jesus is telling us, if you love money, you will never be satisfied. If you long to be rich, you will never get all you want. It is useless. Morgan, your words and your stories up here were so sweet this morning because how many times through the years have I heard kids tell me what they want to do is make a lot of money. I want to be a doctor so I can make a lot of money. I want to be an investment maker so I can make a lot of money. And we, they've just gone on and I want to have a Ferrari. I want to have, even my own little grandson just recently was telling me, saying, Papa, I'm going to build a 10-story house. The third story is going to be yours. I'm going to have two Lamborghinis and I'm going to buy you a Tesla and put it in the garage as well. Well, thank you very much, Devin. <laughs> you know, he's got all these. Guys. And so he drew it. What's that little game he likes to play? Build it. Who? Minecraft. So he built it all on Minecraft and showed it to me on the computer. It's actually a pretty nice house <laughs> for a 10 year old little boy to draw. So Papa has the job then and saying, oh, Davin, you're so sweet and you're so kind, you're generous. And, but, you know, we have to start with the little things, Davin, where we're at. And don't let money burn a hole in your pocket and learn to be generous. And, yes, I know, Papa, I know, Papa. But he's got these dreams. Listen, if you chase after stuff like that, you will never be satisfied. The lesson, remember Jesus said there was a lesson here. The lesson is the blessing of faithfulness. Say that with me. The lesson is the blessing of faithfulness. Say it again. The lesson is a blessing of faithfulness. One more time. I want you to get it. The lesson is the blessing of faithfulness. One of my good friends, fighter pilot, he and I were talking. I was out at the base one day, and he and I played a round of golf. We had lunch in the officer's dining room afterwards, and and he said, you know, he said, Pastor Clanton, he says, one of the things that you often see is guilty pilots. We come home from overseas. He said, we're fly off when we've got a war game, we've got something to do. And he says, you will see wives and little children running up to greet their dads that have partied hard or been unfaithful to the marriage vows. And you can see the guilt written all over their faces. He said, there is a curse on unfaithfulness. There is a blessing on faithfulness to God and faithfulness to one another. Can you say amen? There is a blessing to that. Recently, I was reading in Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. If you were to ask me to quote it to you in King James, I would tell you, and great grace was upon them all. That is the word. The Greek word is charis. But the New Living Translation translates it this way, and it's, it's accurate. So I wanted to read it to you. God's great blessing was upon them all. And this was in the context of financial stewardship. If you look at Acts 4, it's not only in the context of the church being the church, but it's absolutely in the context of financial stewardship or money management. And God said, great blessing was upon them all. How many of you would like to be blessed by God greatly? Can I see your hands this morning? All of us do. God's great blessing was upon them. How? Number one, it all belongs to God. In Acts chapter 4, they all recognize that. We're all under manage, management, and we're all giving something to manage to God. But it's all on loan. You're going to die. You're going to give it away to somebody. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16 and verse 1, Jesus is talking again. He says, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting the rich man's possessions. Here's my question when I read that to myself in my journal. So I ask it to you as well. How well are you taking care of God's property? 
How well are you taking care of God's house? How well are you taking care of God's bed? How well are you taking care of God's food that he's blessed you with? How well are you taking care of your wife or your husband? How well are you taking care of your children? They're all on loan to you from God. One day you're going to have to give them away. Number two, God uses money to test me. God uses money to test my life. You see, the test reveals my true love in life. When God is testing me financially, if I'm going to be faithful to Him with my tithes and my offerings, if I'm going to be faithful to the people that I owe money to, it's a test of my love. Do I love my money more, or do I love God and people more? It's why Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 19, don't store up treasures here on earth. Store your treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will be the desires of your heart also. In other words, my heart is always going to be where my true treasure is. Secondly, the test shows what I truly trust. The test shows what I truly trust in life. Trust in your money, Proverbs 11 and verse 28. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. And as we've emerged from a long gray winter and we've watched our landscape around us flower and we've seen the trees come back to life, I find myself often quoting this verse of Scripture as I'm praying, as I'm worshiping. The godly will flourish like leaves in spring. In other words, you're going to be a flourishing tree because you have trusted in the one who gave his life on the tree to give you eternal life. And we put him first in all we do. So look at me for just, especially those of you watching online, if you're feeling distant from God, if you're feeling spiritually shallow, shallow, if you're feeling powerless in your life, then I would ask you, check your checkbook or check your money management tool that you use on your computer or on your phone because you can find where your true love and your true security is by how you're using your money. Thirdly, the test shows that God can trust me. And so the question is, can God trust you with more? Can God trust you with more than what he's already blessed you with this morning? Look, I need a CEO for my life. I need a chief executive officer for my life. Officer for my life. I need God. I need someone to teach me, to guide me, to give me the principles. And you say, Pastor, isn't that like saying God is a crutch? Of course it's saying God is a crutch. I'm not strong enough to make it in this world without God. You're not strong enough to make it in this world without God. I don't care who you are, the President of the United States, you cannot make it in this world without God. Life is not manageable without God, but life can not only be managed, you can live an overcoming life when Jesus Christ is the CEO of your life. We have to grasp that fact. So in Luke 16, Jesus goes on in the story, and I'm using the complete Jewish version here of the Bible. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful translation. So if you haven't been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who is going to trust you with the real thing? And if you haven't been trustworthy with what belongs to someone else, who will give you what ought to belong to you? Circle in your outline the real thing, the real thing. Circle what ought to belong to you. Honey, they ain't nothing like the real thing. And money ain't it. Life, relationships, peace, and joy, and love, and what ought to belong, what is yours because of what Jesus paid for with his blood at Calvary, what ought to be yours in heaven as well. And that's what Jesus is saying. He wants to give you what really matters in life. I know a very wealthy man. His son started having an affair. So he called his son in and he says, listen, I love you. You're my son. He said, but I'm having my will changed. He said, each of your brothers and sister will get their fair share of this estate and all the businesses that I own. Your wife and your children are going to get your share of the estate and businesses, 
and you're being written out of this will unless you repent now and turn back to God and back to your family. That brought this cocky, self-assured young man to his senses. And I'm happy to tell you that he has served the Lord faithfully and diligently and been a good dad, a good husband. You see, God is saying to each of us in here, one day I'm going to give you more than you can ever dream or imagine. One day, it's not even entered into your mind. Look at me. It's not even entered into your mind what I have prepared for you. And it's going to be yours if you manage well what I've given to you now. I'm not talking about your salvation. You're saved. You're going to heaven. But there's going to be so much more to heaven than just getting in by the skin of your teeth. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> there's going to be so much more to eternity. Thirdly, money is a tool to be used, used for the glory of God. Here's Luke 16, 9. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources. Circle that phrase. <clears throat> Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. What is he saying? Love people and use your money well to serve people with. But if you love money, you will always use people. You get the difference? If you love God and you love people, you will use your money to serve people and to help people with. But if you love money, you will always find yourself using money. And can I say one more thing in light of the story that Jesus told 2,000 years ago? If I've discovered anything, time is far more important than money. Time with my loved ones, time with my friends, time with this church, time with my wife and my kids. The manager in this story was dishonest, but he did three things that God wants me to do and God wants you to do, and that's what Jesus was saying. He, number one, he looked ahead. He looked ahead. So I'm asking you to look ahead this morning. I'm asking you to remember that 10, 10, 80 principle as a starting point. Number one, it all belongs to God anyway. We, we have this abnormal thing of saying the first 10% belongs to God. Let's correct that. 100% of everything I have belongs to God. My marriage belongs to God. My children belong to God. This church belongs to God. My health belongs. It's all God's. And one day I'm going to give a talent, as I told my young friend Daniel, of how I've used my time, I've used my talent, I've used my treasure, and I've used my life story and my testimony. In Japan, last year, the Japanese saved, on average, 39% of their salaries. In Hungary, the average Hungarian saved 17.5% of their salaries. In the United States, we had a big improvement because in 2022, we spent almost 2% more than we made, but last year, we saved 3.5% of our income. And yet, the average church goer is not even giving 3% of their income to the Lord. So God is saying to us, look ahead. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 8, the wise man or the wise woman looks ahead and the fool attempts to fool himself and won't face facts. You're either going to hear well done or you're going to hear depart from me. One day all of us are going to hear that. Secondly, he made a plan. He sat down and though it was a dishonest plan, the owner admired his shrewdness. Now, that's, he's not saying he admired his dishonesty. He admired his shrewdness. He made a plan. A budget, a financial budget, is nothing more than a planned way of how you're going to spend your money. In Proverbs 16 and verse 9, we should make plans counting on God to direct us. Look at your neighbor and say, count on God to direct you this morning. I like the way you're talking to one another. Say it again. Count on God to direct you. Why do we think we're looty tunes if all of a sudden God answers our prayer and speaks to us? You're not crazy. It'll line up with God's word, seek wise Christian counsel, but make plans and God will direct you. And thirdly, this is what Jesus is saying, start today. Stop procrastinating. Take the long view. And when I say the long view, look at me. Don't take that long to write today. T-O-D-A-Y. Okay, now look at me. I'm not talking about retirement. 
I'm talking about eternity. Take the long view. What kind of legacy are you leaving your children? Be dressed for service, Luke 12, 35. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Carmen Price kept her lamp burning. What a testimony her life was at the funeral on Friday at Northbrook Church in Carlton. I remember when Don and I talked after a message that I preached on being involved in your community and giving back to your community. Don and I got together several times and we talked and he said, came to me and said, Pastor, that message has just been burning with Carmen and I and we just feel like we need to, we're driving all the way up here and we just feel like we need to give to our community and be a part of it and to see so many people that were there because Carmen and Don kept their lights burning. And though she left us far too young, don't you know what a glorious welcome awaited her? That's the long view. And then finally this morning, the best use of money is to help people for future realities. I wanted to say heaven. I wanted to say eternity. But I hope the word realities grips your heart this morning. I hope the word reality captures here. The Puritan Thomas Adams says, to part with what we cannot keep that we may gain that we cannot lose is a good bargain. Wealth does no good unless it helps us towards heaven. So Jesus goes on with his story in Luke 16, and he says, here's the lesson Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. <clears throat> and then when your possessions are gone, read it with me, they will welcome you to an eternal home. Jesus is not talking about cheating on your taxes or cheating your employer. He's talking to you about the things, and I admit it's a confusing parable if you just look at its surface, but if you dig into it, it's so rich. And this is what he came to do. They will welcome you into an eternal home. You want to make friends that you're going to meet in heaven. You want to invest your life in building relationships with lost people so that you greet them in heaven or they greet you in heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. That's not why we talk about tithing or giving. We talk about those things to use money as a tool. Jesus has already paid the price. Jesus came into this world at the right time, as I read in the prayer service this morning. It's the right time to die for us when we were helpless in our sins. That's why Jesus did what he did. He loves you so much that the idea of eternity without you breaks his heart. So that passage you see at baseball games and football games and parades, John 3, 16 simply says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The price has already been paid for your salvation. The price has been paid for heaven. And the people that have accepted what God has done for them at Calvary they don't love money and serve money. Money is a tool that they serve God with. They serve their family with. And so Jesus says, build relationships. Build relationships that are going to go on and on for eternity. In other words, use your affluence for influence. Use your affluence. Look at me, not the phone. Use your affluence for influence. Say that with me. Use your affluence for influence. I was getting on a plane in Bogota. A successful ministry trip. And this was in the days before we had all the security that we had before 9-11. Suddenly a young man cries out to me, Pastor, Pastor. And I turned around and there was a young man that had given his heart to Christ and he came in, just gave me a big manly hug. And tears in his eyes, he says, Pastor, we may not see each other again until we get to heaven. 
but I love you. And if you get there before me, look for me, for I'll be there. And if I get there before you, I will look for you. I have never, ever forgotten those words. It is like jet fuel in my spirit. Look for me, because I'm going to be looking for you. Make friends for eternity. Can you say amen? Stand with me this morning if you would. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I just want to do things a little differently this morning. Would you just imagine right now a hundred, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred friends waiting to greet you in heaven? People that you've influenced to know Jesus. I know you want to be emotionally healthy and relationally healthy and physically healthy. But Jesus comes right down to something that affects us in every area of our life. That's being financially healthy. So before I pray for us, let me ask you this. And you just talk to the Lord in your mind right now. Just talk to God as I'm talking to you. Does God have first place in your life? If you were to check your checkbook or your money manager, does God have first place in your life? Does God trust you? Can God trust you with what you already have? Are you stewarding your marriage well, your family well, your opportunities well? What are you investing for eternity? How are you building friends for eternity? Now I want you to pray with me and pray with Becky and me, I should say, as I, as I close this service. Just say it in your mind, Father, I don't want to waste anything that you've given to me. Father, I don't want to love the gifts I want to love the giver of the gifts. You gave me the idea, the mind, the strength, my family. Father, I don't want to live for the gifts that you've given me. I want to live for the glory of God and seek your kingdom first. Father, I don't want to trust in what you've given me for my security. And I certainly don't expect it to satisfy me. For only Jesus can satisfy my soul. So, Father, what I want to do is I want to show you how I love you by how I use what you have given me. I want to show you how I trust you by what you've given me. Lord, I confess that it's all alone to me anyway and that when I die, somebody else is going to be blessed with it. Father, I want to use my money to do good. Give me good ideas, Lord. And Father, I want a plan. And I count on you to bless me as I plan. And I ask you, Lord, that I will make friends for eternity and use my affluence for influence. Now, Father, for all that have prayed this prayer this morning with me, I ask you that according to Acts chapter 4, that your great grace, your great blessings will rest upon us supernaturally. I pray that wherever we go, that the fragrance of the Lord himself 
will be sensed about us, that when we sit at a table that people will glance at us because of the sense of God's presence and anointing upon our lives. I, I pray that wherever we go that the love of God would be revealed, and that people, Lord, will be hungry and thirsty for who we know. Make us, Lord, I pray, like sweet candy, but filled with the goodness of God that people will be eager for what we have. Now, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, then I'm asking you to do this right now. This is the place to start. Remember, Jesus said it's about your heart. The problem of the heart is the heart. So would you give your heart to Jesus today? That's what he really wants. Because when Jesus has my heart, he has everything. He's already given you his heart when he gave you his son. So just pray this with me right now. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, as much as I know how, I commit my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and make me a passionate follower of Jesus Christ, I pray. In his name, amen, amen, and amen. Now may the face of God and the smile of God and all the blessings of heaven be upon you and leave this place knowing great grace is upon your life today. God bless you. Go in peace.